Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach and teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level, to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Today's episode is going to be quite different from what you are used to hear on my podcast. The main difference is that I knew absolutely nothing about the topic or the book we are going to explore until I was approached by my guest about coming on my show to talk about it, which means that I had no opinion about any of this until I read the book, which is unusual for my show. <laughs> Secondly, because this book covers so many topics and the material presented in it is quite rich and unique, rather than focusing on a specific topic using the book as the background, I decided to do this episode about the book itself, about Theauba prophecy, why and how it was written, including some technical aspects of it, and then address several points in the material that raised questions or evoked certain reactions in my mind as I was reading it. So my approach will be quite different and I hope engaging and worthwhile. The book Theauba Prophecy was written by Michael de Marquet in 1989. It was first published in 1993, with few reprints after that, with the last edition published in 2022. The full title of this book is Theauba Prophecy, The Golden Planet, Abduction to the Ninth Planet, a true report by the author who was physically abducted to another planet. The book details the author's nine-day journey to Theauba, a distant planet, accompanied by Thao, a beautiful extraterrestrial. Thao and other ETs shared with Michael information about the history of the Earth and its inhabitants with many intriguing details. There are too many to mention here, so I refer you simply to the book to find out. The central theme of the book is that the principal obligation of human beings on Earth is to develop our spirituality, while technology should assist in the spiritual development and not be used to enslave us in the machine of materialism. My special guest, who actively promotes the book and its messages, Speaking about it on podcasts, radio shows, and presentations is Samuel Chong. Samuel is a certified court interpreter and Chinese translator. He graduated from UC Berkeley with a Bachelor of Arts in Economics and from University of Carlos III in Madrid with a Master of Arts in Financial Analysis. Samuel met in person Michael de Marquet, the author of Theauba Prophecy, and developed a close relationship with him until Michael's passing in 2018. Samuel was instrumental in arranging for the Chinese publication of the Marquez book, which became a rare bestseller in both China and Taiwan. He currently resides in Los Angeles, in California. You will find more information about Samuel and his work, with many links to his online presence, on my podcast website, at quantumlivingpodcast.com. And now, please join me and Samuel in this uncommon conversation as we decode Theauba prophecy. Hello, Samuel. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you very much for having me here. As I said in my intro, I knew nothing about Theauba prophecy, never heard of it, never read it until now. 
So this will be an interesting conversation. <laughs> My first reaction after reading it is that a lot of information and concepts shared by the ETs are quite well known and are part of the current social discourse. There are also some very intriguing pieces of information. And then there are several that raise question marks, bother me, or simply don't resonate with me at all. And I just disagree with them. And that's what I would like to focus on in our conversation and ask you to offer some explanation or clarification of those points, if you can. To begin with, could you please tell us briefly how you came across the book and why do you actively promote it? What drives you and what is your objective? When I was young, I was very curious about everything, the paranormal and everything that seemed to be strange and out of the ordinary. I was very interested in the ETs because I thought if the ETs could come and visit us, they must have advanced technologies and knowledge, and we can just learn from them to progress at a much faster pace. So in my subconscious mind, I was always looking for books written by ET contactees. So back in 2014, I was searching on Amazon, looking for books written by ET contactees, and I came across this book. I checked it out. And then after reading it, I couldn't put it down because it contains a lot of fascinating facts, specific verifiable facts that I was later able to investigate further. And uh, the reason for me to promote the book is that I learned about the one thing that the author, uh, Michael Michel de Marquet, mentioned in the postscript, saying that he was not allowed to write that one thing he learned from the ETs because we were far from understanding them. So I was very curious about that and I met him in person and he told me what that one thing was. And after I learned about it, I thought it was so important to the destiny or future of uh, not just Americans, not just Australians, not just the Chinese or the Indians, but the entire mankind on earth. It's so important that we have to listen to the warnings of the ETs and to mend our ways so that we can change the future for the better. So this is my whole motivation of spreading the messages of the book, encouraging people to read it so that they can make the right choices for the future. Thank you. I was actually going to ask this question a bit later, but now that you mentioned, I think it's a good place <laughs> to ask. Can you tell us what is that thing that the author wasn't able, what wasn't allowed to include in the book, or you are under the oath of secrecy? I was actually under the oath of secrecy, not to tell anyone else about it. Okay. But what they didn't tell me about it was that I couldn't write an article revealing as many clues, giving as many hints as possible. Okay. So in my article, if the reader reads between the lines, they can understand what it is generally about. So the title of the article is The Second Coming of Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you. And I guess a, a broader question on this point that I'm, I'm sure many of my listeners would want to ask is if there is information or some knowledge that the author was not allowed to pass on, for what purpose did those ETs give it to him in the first place? I mean... If there is something that can't be discussed or, or written about, why mention it in the first place to him? Well, um, for security reasons, uh, for other purposes or other reasons that I'm not sure about. But I think one of the most important thing is that people, after reading the book, should make the right choices for the future. And there is definitely a reason for the author not including that information in the book because it relates to events that might happen or might not happen. Because according to this book, the future depends on our actions, our collective consciousness. So if we make, if we make the right choices for the future, then things will be very, very good uh, uh, for the future. And But if the things don't change 
uh, to the right direction, then we are going to be heading a catastrophe. So the future is very uncertain. So this is why uh, the name or actually the title of the book is a misnomer. It's not a book of prophecy. It's a book of warnings from the ETs. So the one thing that the author was told might or might not happen in the future. Thank you. Well, you've answered my question beautifully. And in fact, you must be reading my mind because that was my next question, specifically about the use of the word prophecy in the title, because I could not find a prophecy. And we know that prophecy is a psychic vision of the future for someone or something predicting what will happen. Now, if we adopt the premise that the future is not fixed and some events may or may not happen depending on our action or non-action, then the word like warnings or, or predictions probably would be better reflecting the content of the book. Exactly. The name, um, the title of the book, Theoba Prophecy, was actually uh, given not by the author himself, but by Dr. Tom Chaco, who wanted to catch people's attention by so. having a book titled <laughs> uh, Prophecy. But, but in a sense, the book does contain uh, predictions uh, in the future because uh, the book was actually published in 1993, but a lot of the facts in the book were proven after or years after the book was published in Australia. For example, the antibacterial effects of yellow light and blue light was actually proven um, years or decades after the book was published. And also um, about the, the ET basis on the far side of the moon is actually indicated in this book and now getting more confirmations from uh, whistleblowers or astronauts, yeah. also including the life on Mars. Uh, this is included in the book, which is now proven by scientists as well. So, so a lot of the things were proven years after the book was published. Yes, I agree with you, but I would like to make an important distinction because there is still something that is missing. So, yes, I can tell that a number of facts presented in the book, which was published back then, with the blue light and Mars and, and there were a few others, can now be verified. But what is missing to me is there is no actual prophecy, which is, if you don't change your ways, this is what is going to happen. Now, Thao said there will be some catastrophic events, but none of those events are really described or specified. So I still have a question mark about what, according to Theobans, <laughs> what will happen in the future for humanity, for our planet, if we don't change our ways, which is discussed in the book. I still couldn't see it. What is this catastrophic future? Well, um, I think uh, if you look at history, we can learn from the past. If people believe that uh, some of the information contained in the Book of Enoch was real or true, then we can make a reference of it. So Enoch was taken away by gods or Theobans. Actually, Michel de Marquet, Michael de Marquet, after he read the Book of Enoch, he firmly believed that Enoch was actually taken by the same group of ETs to their planet. And then someone was instructed to write the Book of Enoch. So we have the Book of Enoch. And then a few decades later, Noah, the great grandson of Enoch, was told to build an ark. So everyone knows what's hap what happened to Noah. And we can also kind of learn from the history, especially from the Old Testament of the Bible, what happened to the two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, we have to look at the Jewish texts because they're more detailed. So the citizens of the two cities were so evil that they punished the compassionate people. They punished the girl for helping a beggar on the street by giving him food. They tortured the girl to death. And this is how evil the people in the two cities were at that time. So that's, I think, is going to lead to a catastrophe like a catastrophic event. Uh, and I think we have to take the warnings very seriously. And actually the book warns us about the danger of materialism. If we keep going the way we are going right now, 
using the technology to accumulate more wealth, then we are going to be very jealous of each other. The rich is going to look down on the poor, and the poor is going to be very jealous of the rich. And uh, it's going to there is a thin line between jealousy and hatred, and there's going to be a lot of conflicts between the different classes of people in the world, and that's going to create a catastrophic event in the future. But I think the real warning is to take the suggestions of the ETs is to really. Look at what is really going on behind the scenes. The real dangers on Earth to be number one, money; number two, politicians; number three, journalists and drugs; and number four, religions. And learn how to really respond to the current situations by acting in a very nonviolent way, with a concerted action, uniting the people in the world together, have a nonviolent strike. Against the tyrannies in the world, and then that way we can change the future for the better. I think that's actually the gist of the book. Okay, thank you. Couple of points here, and I will come back to to those four or five key dangers because I, I would like to address them specifically. But back to my key point here. So what you're saying is that the prophecy is not described as such, but it is implied. Exactly. Okay. Yes. If you read the book, you're going to know that throughout history, the ETs. From Theuba have been helping us or mentoring us, just like our parents, teaching us the basic principles and the reasons for living on Earth is actually to develop our spirituality. And sometimes parents give us、uh, suggestions or、uh, kind of principles and to follow. And sometimes we follow, and sometimes we don't.、Mm-hmm. There are consequences to our actions. So we really have to know. What is the right way to go about?、Uh, what are the right choices to make in the future?、Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. And again, I will come back to this point a bit later on. Now, this is actually what is really curious for me. <laughs> I am a writer. I also write, so the process of writing is is quite familiar to me. And the author claims that this is nonfiction about an actual event and experience that he had. And that he wrote this book based on his memory of the event, and also some subsequent information downloads from those ETs. If this is nonfiction, which he was so strongly defending, my question is: as a writer and a reader, <laughs> why did he write this book in a fiction style? Because the book is mainly a dialogue, it is very well written, by the way, with flowery comments and reflections that you normally find in a fiction book. Why didn't he write it in a report or an essay style, which is much more credible as nonfiction, rather than in a flowery? And often emotional dialogue. So, so there is a, a bit of a disconnect to me personally, if you like. And secondly, there is an incredible amount of detail in his observations and descriptions of what he saw and experienced. A, a really detailed information. So, my second question is: How did he remember all that? Because what it implies to me, or what it might indicate, is. Embellishment, the writer's imagination. So overall, to me, the book reads like a novel, like fiction. So I'm having problem with it. Could you please speak to this? Yes,、uh, indeed. When I first read the book until the chapters before "Who Is Christ," I thought the book was just a, a fiction, a fictional story that he imagined.、Uh, but there are so many specific, verifiable facts in the chapter "Who Is Christ." That I really、um, decided that this book has to be a book of nonfiction. The reason that he writes in a in such a descriptive 
a fictional style. I think it's because his job was actually to record or describe everything that he saw, heard, and experienced on a different planet that is totally different from ours. That planet Theuba is just like a paradise. Everything is so perfect, and the colors are so bright, and, and the people are so compassionate and loving to, to him that is so different from what he experienced on Earth. So this is why, you know, there for him to use um, descriptive words to describe that planet, he had to write in a way that's so detailed that it may sounds or it may reads like a science fiction. Uh, but in fact, if you get into the later chapters, you're going to see there are just so many facts, specific facts that uh, made the book to be um, a book uh, that deserves special attention, deserves special investigations. And in terms of the tones of the book, in the main text of the book, I find the tone to be very calm and very objective. But in the postscript, the tone became becomes a little bit uh, personal and also, I would say, anguish or uh, upsetting. Uh, um, and I think uh, that's probably because the author, uh, Mr. Demarquet, he wasn't able to reveal that one thing he learned about, learned from the ETs, and he couldn't write in the book. He couldn't really voice his frustration on what's happening on Earth right now. This is why in the postscript you see a totally different tone the, uh, from the from the main text of the of the book. Um, so I think you have to make a distinction over there. In terms of how he is able to remember all the details, um, he went to the planet in person and then came back. After he came back, um, they actually assisted him in writing the book. Um, sometimes he would forget all the details and information and pictures would uh, be downloaded to him. So he would remember all the details. So in the postscripts, he describes the process of uh, writing the book, which is a little bit different from our normal process. Yes, I gather that he decided to present the book in a fiction style with dialogues, maybe to make it more interesting to begin with for the reader. I think the reason he used the dialogue style of writing the book is because he wants to make sure that the readers know that it is the E.T. that Tao was talking about the events that occurred on Earth, okay. the ancient civilizations, what happened on Earth uh, in the ancient past, where we all came from, not from him, because he heard it from Tao or Tao, the uh, E.T., um, and, and he wants the readers to do their own investigation, to have their own independent thinking, uh, not just to take the words of Tao, but also to have additional research done on the facts and information provided by Tao, the E.T. Thank you, yes, and this makes sense. So thank you for clarifying that for us. Okay, let's now move on to the material itself presented in the book. We need to keep in mind that this experience took place in 1987 and the book was first published in 1993. But still, since those ETs can apparently see our future and know everything about us, they shouldn't be giving Michael the wrong information. So I'm going to pick on a few points that stood out for me, and I hope that you can offer us some explanation of that. One such example is when they talk about quote-unquote accidents in the creation involving the genes, such as albino animals, four-leaf clover plants, etc. That may be so, but then they said that our appendix, the appendix in our body, is also such an accident and that it has no use in the human body whatsoever. Now, that is simply not true. Recent scientific and medical studies over the past 20 years or so have found that the appendix has two important functions. It supports the immune system by fighting infections in the gut and is also housing the good bacteria. So yes, we can live without it if it's taken out in, in a surgery, 
just like we can live without the tonsils. But the absence of these organs negatively impacts the strength of our immune system. And so the appendix is definitely not useless, as Tao said. So what happened there? To me, it sounds like this information came from the author's memory banks, as at the time, science didn't recognize the importance of the appendix, and it was, in fact, considered to be useless. And it turned out to be not true. So for me, there is a disconnect between the great knowledge of those ETs and passing on factual information that is actually incorrect. Could you please speak to this, if you can? Yeah. As you know, the medical communities have a lot of uh, theories or hypotheses about certain things, and they change quite a bit over the years. 200 years ago, the medical doctors in the U.S. used mercury to treat patients. Now we know that mercury is actually... Poison. Yes, it's poison. It's actually a poison causing neurological issues. And uh, and you mentioned about the uh, appendix uh, providing a space for good bacteria to, 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 to live. And it can also provide space for bad bacteria as well. So it goes both ways. But I want to point out that the medical community uh, has a lot of uh, changes over the years. Uh, back a few decades ago, uh, they theorized that cancer was caused by one thing, but now they say cancer is caused by so many things. And same thing is about uh, diabetes and other diseases. So they keep but uh, developing themselves, and sometimes they say that uh, something's good, and, and uh, a few years later they say, "Oh, it's not so good." So the so they keep changing. I I, I just don't think that uh, we should rely on the uh, so-called medical doctors for for this kind of information because uh, back uh, four hundred years ago we also believed that uh, Earth was the center of the universe, and uh, and everything revolves around Earth. Uh, so that's and people got burned on the stake for believing otherwise. So we have to consider uh, the facts, uh, what happened in the history, uh, in the past, uh, versus now. So what the doctors say now may not necessarily be correct. Thank you. And I actually accept your uh, explanation because it makes sense. However, <laughs> yes, I agree that medical science and, and all science, in fact, changes, as you have said, all the time. But the key point for me is that I don't believe that there is anything in a human body which is not accidental, such as cancer growing or some and so the underlying premise for me is that every organ in a human body that we are normally born with has an important function, which may or may not be known at certain point in time. But it is not useless. I mean, it's always there. And so I find it hard to believe that, that it is is useless and it is just an accident, a you know, genetic mishap. It really doesn't talk about genetic mishaps. It's just an accident uh, by from the process of making the human body by the creator. And it really wants to emphasize that there are accidents in the universe. And uh, we have to really consider that uh, the future is affected by accidents as well. So, so this is actually the point that uh, I think the author was trying to make, or the ETs are trying to make. And in terms of the appendix, I think, uh, I think it could be an accident. Even though some people believe that it has certain fun functions, I do believe all the other organs on the human body have certain functions. And there are also bodies that we cannot see, like the human energy fields and also the chakras and the other bodies as well. So we have to consider the workings or the the workings of the universe is not uh, uh, fixed 
because sometimes the asteroid can hit Earth. That's an accident. Sometimes uh, uh, when in the process of making certain things, you you sometimes uh, have a small accident when making that. And I think uh, it's, it's possible. Okay. Now, you said just a moment ago that those ETs made a point that there are accidents in the creation. And just briefly, I would like to touch on this point because it is in conflict with the commonly adopted and accepted view in the spiritual narrative, if you like, which says that there are no accidents in the creation, that everything that ever was, is, and will be, speaking on our linear timeline, already exists, and there is no such thing as accident, that there is also obviously synchronicity, but whatever happens, even if it's strange and unusual and unique and one-off, was meant to happen. Now, this obviously we are now stepping outside of, of the book, but I would be curious to hear your, your own personal view. Yeah, the book emphasizes the cause and effect or karmatic effect, karmas, that people always talk about. And the book says once you do certain things and uh, the effects will come either in this lifetime or um, next lifetime or a few lifetimes afterwards. Um, so there is a cause and effect in, in the mentioned in this book, actually is one of the key points in the book as well. There is a percentage of uh, things that are sure to happen versus accidents. And I would suggest that uh, in, in, the, in the book that it implies that karmatic effects um, are about 81% of the time that certain things happen. And the other 19% of the time, uh, those could be accidents. Uh, because in the book, the 81% and 19%, uh, these two numbers appear three times in the book. And I do believe that if you find the uh, specific verifiable facts in the book, you're going to believe that uh, the rest of the book uh, may have some validity. And you are going to kind of incline to believe that there are like 85% of the time um, that things happen for a reason but the other 19% will be, for some reason, accidents uh, in nature. This is really an open-ended question because, because it's very difficult to find the answer. But I hear what you're saying, and I guess we'll leave it to our listeners to decide. Yeah, I, I, I do think that uh, everything happens for a reason. And there are uh, reasons for us having this conversation. Oh, yes. And there are reasons <laughs> for me to be able to find um, uh, the author and to learn about uh, the one thing he didn't write in the book. And I think uh, it's no accident that I was uh, born a Chinese person, came to the U.S. and then um, studied in, in, in Spain and, and to actually promote uh, not messages in this book, but also um, other messages in, in other books as well. Uh, so so I think uh, it's very important for us to know that uh, we are destined for certain things. Uh, we, we all have life missions. And, and uh, I think it's, it's important to keep that in mind as well. Absolutely. And by the way, I have nothing against challenging the status quo or the current narrative or paradigm. In fact, I quite like to do that, <laughs> because in my view, if we don't challenge the current status quo or the paradigm or the narrative, there is no progress because everything remains the same. So, so thank you for your explanation. Now, I find it really strange. How come such an advanced race still travels through the cosmos in a linear fashion, albeit very fast, several times the speed of light, as they said? But it still takes time, instead of using wormholes to get to their destination instantly in another galaxy or even in another universe. And again, this feels to me like a reflection of the knowledge of space technology at that time. And I didn't find in the book any an explanation for that. So perhaps I've missed it. So could you address this point for us? Thank you. Yeah, very good question. I'm glad you asked. 
uh, Michelle or Michael told me that they did travel using what they would call substantiation, um, using teleportation, in another word, to travel through space and time. Um, so what happens is that they have to go into deep space in order for that to happen. Because uh, according to the ETs, if they were to use teleportation or uh, transubstantiation in the Earth's uh, atmosphere, uh, their spaceship would have been exploded. So they have to go into deep space and then teleport themselves to another location um, near their planet. So this is uh, why I think it's important to realize that uh, uh, they do know all these things. It's just that we are not knowledgeable enough to know that we have to use this wormholes in deep space. So this is actually a hint for our scientists. Uh, they should study wormholes once they're able to uh, do experiments simulating the uh, environment of deep space, not in the earthly uh, environment. Okay. Now, I can understand that it may take some time and, and a different process to leave the immediate space around the Earth, or maybe even our solar system, or maybe even our galaxy, for various reasons that we may not necessarily understand at this point in time. But I recall specifically that the whole journey took some time, and the way it is revealed to us is through those conversations, lengthy conversations that Michael had with Thao on the spaceship during the trip, and then they visited another planet on the way, etc. But those lengthy dialogues and conversations reveal how much time it took to actually get to Thia Uba. Yeah. And I also remember distinctly at some point, Thao said, we are now approaching Thauba. We'll be there in 20 minutes. Again, they were already in their own space, and yet they were traveling still in a linear fashion because it would take them 20 minutes to get to the planet. So I'm still having some, some question marks around that. So what happens is that they first uh, travel at the speed a few times faster than the speed of light into deep space. And then at the location in deep space, they use the transubstantiation or teleportation through wormholes to travel to another location in deep space, which is closer to their planet, the Uba. And then from that location in time, they traveled again at the time uh, a few times faster than speed of light to their destination, which is the planet the Uba. And then we read that part, oh, we are going to approach that uh, our destination in 20 minutes or so. They were already decelerated by a lot. So if you calculate the speed, that's actually slower than the speed of light. Uh, but that's because they were already decelerating uh, for a long time already. Uh, so so they, they did travel uh, using wormholes, uh, using a word, but what Michelle or Meg would call is the transubstantiation uh, or teleportation. Okay, thank you. Now, with my next question or on my next point, there's really no way to beat around the bush here. So I will just say it. <laughs> I have to say that throughout the book, and there were particular parts of it, and it was about the communication, those it is communication with Michael, where I found some of their comments patronizing at times even condescending and autocratic, as if they were omnipotent like God. And I would just give specific examples, which to me was very jarring, because this is unlike highly evolved spiritual beings, as far as I'm concerned. And so this bothers me, 
And my instant reaction to some of those comments, which I will quote in a moment, was, oh, really? <laughs> so I'd like to quote directly from the book, and then I will ask you to comment on that or explain. So here are some of those quotes. We, the people of Theauba, are assigned to assist, guide, and sometimes punish the inhabitants of planets under our guardianship. If the child should require physical punishment, as unfortunately is sometimes the case, isn't it important that the parent be physically stronger than the child? Certain adults who refuse to listen and who are absolutely stubborn also need to be corrected by physical means. The only solution for you is to follow the example of the government of Mu. Our role as beings of a superior planet is to guide, to help with spiritual development, and even sometimes materially. We are in a position to give material assistance because we are technologically the most advanced people. Michael, of course you look at such things in a very simplified way. Everything for you is black and white, but there are also many shades of gray. So my immediate reaction as questions, if you like, in my mind was, who gave them the right to interfere with other civilizations and with us and to assume their omnipotent guardianship, I assume without our permission, which sounds more like dictatorship, punishing the beings physically when they disobey? Who said that they are the most technologically advanced people, beings of a superior planet, who can patronize and demean us as an intelligent and primitive race, thinking in a simplified way, unable to grasp the nuances of the nature of reality. Honestly, Samuel, <laughs> if Aniti spoke to me in this manner, I would have told them to fly off <laughs> and go back to where they came from, because this has nothing to do with our spiritual evolution. So I emphasized specific words in those comments. I actually had quite an adverse reaction to them speaking in such a, well, patronizing manner. And I really wanted to bring this up because it really doesn't sit well with me. Could you please speak to this for a moment? Yeah, it's probably because I came from China, so I, I didn't really uh, emphasize on what you uh, felt. Because to a Chinese person, it seems very normal because a parent um, has the responsibility of leading the children to the right path. And if if uh, the father sees the, the son or the daughter playing fire and leading to, to, to his uh, or her destruction, then the father would just have, have to prevent it from happening, sometimes using physical force if necessary. So so in China, this is quite common, uh, and also in a lot of Asian cultures too. So um, to me, it's just uh, very normal. But uh, what if uh, that they are telling is true, that they are indeed uh, guiding us throughout history, trying to help us, and they have... Uh, provided a lot of guidance uh, in a very uh, nice way uh, or compassionate way or loving way in the past. But uh, sometimes they worked, sometimes uh, they didn't work. And what if we kept disobeying um, our spiritual path or deviating from our spiritual path um, despite the repeated suggestions or mentorship or warnings? What if we keep doing the things that are going to distract ourselves in the future despite their interventions, their their stern warnings. And I think uh, sometimes uh, uh, it's just like, uh, I would say, uh, corrective actions to repeated criminals. <laughs> if, if, you, if you know like a person who uh, has stolen uh, 
things multiple times and, and been put in jail multiple times. But but he still, when he goes out, uh, comes out from jail, does the same thing. Do you think uh, it, it's still uh, kind of feasible to to tell that person in a very nicely way that you shouldn't steal? That may work, but that's because the person stealing things is, is a minor offense. Uh, it's not going to cause the destruction of that person. But what if the person keeps doing things that are going to distract himself? It's going to kill himself. I think uh, physical force or physical uh, corrective measures are going to be necessary to prevent uh, that person from destroying himself. And I think that's probably uh, how I felt after <laughs> this, reading this book and also to think about how the universe works. It's impossible for everything to be on the same level. We do have people who are more intelligent, the people who need more help in learning certain things. But we do have primitive beings on Earth and on different planets, but we also have advanced beings. So I think uh, different beings have different roles in the universe. It happens to be that Earth is on a very primitive planet. We have to be living in a very harsh environment to learn the spiritual lessons. Uh, we have to die after a few decades. But the people on Theuba, they're so highly advanced that they never age. They are forever looking like in their 30s. So they have all the knowledge and they were actually responsible for the birth of Jesus and also Christ uh, teaching us the principles of uh, spiritual development and also reincarnation, um, by the way. So they they happen to take on this role in guiding us so that we can grow much faster and without uh, all the hurdles um, of destroying ourselves. So I think uh, it's, it's the law of the universe that uh, different ETs have different roles on different planets. Okay, but your comparison in they mention to bringing up a child is is a really a stretch for me because they are not our parents. They are not our guardians. So the bottom line to me is who assigned them the role of our guardians without our permission or agreement? I have a problem with that. So my question is, are they the only, or do they believe that they are the only highly evolved, both technologically and spiritually, extraterrestrial race assigned this role? And if so, who assigned this role to them? Was it God? <laughs> Did they just decide, oh, well, we, we're just going to do this? Was it uh, the intergalactic council or inter-universal council of civilizations, some sort of governing body, if you like. Could you please speak to this? So there's a difference between God, the creator, and the ETs. There, if you, I'm sure you know, there are nine different categories of planets, and they say they live on category nine planet. Sometimes they join, rejoin the great ether, the creator. So they sometimes disappear. Uh, making themselves uh, part of the creator, the the pure spirit, the great spirit. So I would say that they're giving a hand to us by having Michelle or Michael to write this book. Um, it's, uh, but the book also emphasizes the importance of free will. They are giving us an olive branch. Uh, we can have our own free will to take it or not to take it. Because in the book it says... Um, on Earth, there is a great need for discipline, but discipline does not mean dictatorship. The great spirit, the creator himself, obligates no creature, human or otherwise, to do anything against their will. We all have free will, and it is up to us to discipline ourselves in order to improve spiritually. To impose one's will on another 
in a way which deprives the individual of the privilege of exercising his own free will is one of the greatest crimes that man can commit. So this is this is in the book emphasize that we all have our own free will. So they are uh, giving us suggestions of what we need to do to change our future for the better. We, of course, can choose to take it or not to take it, but we have to know the consequences. Um, and it's important, important to know that uh, um, they are helping us without our permission, but uh, but I would permit them to help us. <laughs> this is just my personal opinion. I uh, definitely would uh, be very, very willing to receive their help but it's, it's also up to others whether to take the message in the book seriously or not. It, it's up to their free will. So there's no obligation at all. Well, yes, I agree. There is no obligation. And, and for argument's sake, we can just choose not to uh, take any of their advice and, and information that they shared with us. I don't mean to labor the point, but still the way the language and the way and the attitude with which they made some of those comments doesn't sit well with me because I believe there are other ways of communicating important messages and alerting us to, to certain ways, but uh, that's okay. Well, I can add one more point. Sure. The reason you probably feel the tone is too stern or too kind of uh, patriotic is probably because... Patronizing, yeah. Mm-hmm. Patronizing is probably because the urgency of the situation we are in. For example, if you see a person almost uh, walking to the edge of a cliff and, and he is going to fall from the cliff and then you have to warn him, are you going to use like a, a, a regular compassion and loving words to say, oh, it's okay, don't No, I just grab him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just grab them. So, so this is, but, but, yeah, so but but also you have to respect the free will of the person walking down the path. And, and he might choose to fall from the cliff, but you have to be helpful to him by telling him that it's dangerous out there if you keep walking that way. If you grab him from falling, then you are actually intervening against his free will. So this is the position that the ETs are taking right now. So they are just trying to warn us the urgency of the danger ahead of us by using this kind of uh, patronizing voice or, or tone. And, and I find that to be very interesting because I'm really glad you mentioned it. Um, when you are, when you know that in a, a few decades of time that you're going to be facing the situation Noah was facing or maybe um, Eno was facing, and also, if you knew uh, a few decades of time uh, ahead of that, if you knew that a few decades later, you're going to be like the cities of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, then you're trying to warn and to, to warn the people of the two cities, then you probably have to use a very different tone uh, from the tones that you used before, which was more kind of compassion and love and spiritual in a sense, you have to really warn of the dangers to the people so that the people can pay attention. And I think uh, for some people, this tone works by uh, attracting attention of the people. But for some people, okay, uh, the tone may be... Uh, so maybe it pitch. doesn't work for me. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. And obviously... Every person reading the book has their own filters, if you like. Yeah, I want to add one more point. Sure. Is that, uh, for for example, if uh, I were really to want to destroy the entire civilization, I would just use uh, sugar-coated missiles by saying that you're doing well when in fact they're not doing well. I would just use a lot of uh, very nice uh, words saying that, Oh, you 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 just keep walking down the path that you're walking right now. Everything will be fine, and you're all highly advanced beings on Earth. You're highly spiritual, and you're doing everything you're uh, correctly. And uh, just by sugarcoating everything that that uh, that is not true. So so I think uh, facts are facts. So we have to realize that the reality is that we have to face. 
um, everything is not uh, that perfect. Um, sometimes uh, you get a D, it is what it is. You you fail the class, it is what it is. You, you can, really cannot expect someone to tell you that you're doing well when you fail the class. Oh, absolutely. And, and I would never suggest this for a moment. But my point is that if they specifically told us what will be the outcome if we don't change our ways, that would have a much stronger impact rather than imply throughout the book with warnings that you are on the wrong path. But without actually telling us you will end up like Sodom and Gomorrah or like Atlantis. Instead, allowing us just to figure it out, which obviously we can, but I would argue that the impact would be much stronger if they've actually included the prophecy. If you don't change your ways and continue on your current pathway, this is what's going to happen. Because then we, we, we just went, oh my God, no, you know, we don't want this to happen and we need to change our way. So the impact would have been much greater, don't you think? Yes, I agree. <laughs> totally agree. So this is what Michelle told me, what Michael told me, that he didn't put in the book. So this is my whole motivation. So he was told the actual outcome, potential outcome, which he didn't put in the book. That's okay. Right. Thank you. So that's sort of... <laughs> <laughs> takes us back to the beginning of the conversation. Thank you. Okay, so this explains a lot. <laughs> okay, now I'd like to come back to those five greatest dangers mentioned by the ET. They said money, politicians, journalists, and drugs, and religions. And I've got a few comments on that. In principle, I would agree, but with few significant qualifications. And we could, by the way, have a whole episode on just those five dangers, but I'll try to be succinct. In my mind, they address these issues in a quite simplistic and shallow way. First of all, rather than saying politicians and journalists, they should probably say politics and the media. And they said, on your planet, money is the worst of all evils. Well, I disagree. Money is simply energy. It is the intent behind the money that makes it either good or evil. And their disdain for materialism as harmful to human race is also one-sided and shallow. And yes, it is harmful, absolutely, if it takes over spirituality and common sense, but it is also an integral part of our experience on earth, where we need to learn to manage it in balance with spirituality and common sense at which point it is not all bad. And they give us only the worst examples. They don't say anything about accumulating wealth for the purpose of helping others, the planet or the greater good. Say, if I wanted to have a lot of money to support charities, education, research, the environment, disadvantaged people, etc., that money in my hands would be an ambrosia of gods that can sustain, save, and improve life experience of many people because of my intent. Now, I agree with drugs, obviously, that goes without saying, but also the other three issues, politics, the media, and religions, are very complex establishments and forces that, again, can serve either good or evil. So my point is that they are treating those dangers in a quite one-sided and, as I said, shallow way, because it's not those issues by themselves, but the intent behind them. Could you please comment on this? Well, the book, uh, by saying money is the number one real danger on earth, 
uh, means that uh, the big corporations have to serve the interests of their shareholders, the pharmaceutical industries, the energy industry, the education industry, and they have to really earn a lot of money and keep the machine going. Sometimes they have to suppress the, for example, ways of curing diseases such as cancer or diabetes. Um, if a person has diabetes, then then it's a very profit making um, like a way <laughs> of uh, having that person to rely on the medications for his or her life. Um, and but there are ways to cure diabetes that people don't know about. If they read uh, the books written by Anthony Wheeler and the medical media, they're going to know that there there are very inexpensive ways of curing type two diabetes. Absolutely. But the drug companies, they don't really emphasize or they don't actively promote the ways of curing such diseases because they rely on the patients to make profits. So the book talks about money being number one real danger on earth uh, by indicating that it's a big corporation's greedy shareholders that we should be uh, knowledgeable, <laughs> uh, uh, we should we should be careful of. And that's that's the whole issue. But also to your point, if you have a lot of money and if you want to put it into the use of charities and helping the poor, then how are you going to gain a lot of money uh, that easily uh, by doing the things that are spiritual? That's another challenge that I've been trying to to overcome. It's not as easy as the drug or energy companies just uh, uh, doing whatever they're doing right now. <laughs> and uh, for us, the spiritual people, it's kind of hard for us to to really gain a lot of or accumulate a, a lot of material wealth. Actually, a lot of my friends are living on poverty lines, which always breaks my heart. A lot of people having three jobs and, and they have a lot of credit card debts and single mothers. And, and it always breaks my heart. I really cannot emphasize more on that. So that's the point that the book is trying to make. Yeah, so that's perhaps more about the language or the semantics and how they presented this concept because when they elaborate on, on it, then yes, obviously. I guess what is missing for me in it is that they don't actually say that money is just energy, a means of exchange in our current society. And it is the intent behind it that makes it either good or evil. Yeah. So the this is uh, very interesting and unique about the book. It touches upon so many points, but doesn't really go in depth about uh, all the points that the book is trying to make. It wants us to do our own research, our own investigation, our own interpretation on the messages contained in the book. So we have to do our own homework in order to grow and spiritually. <laughs> so this is this is something that really frustrates me um, to try to explain the concept in the book because I have to do a lot of my own research, my own interpretation. Um, and, and people have different interpretations too. So that always is something very unique <laughs> about this book. Of course, yeah. of course. And I guess the key question is, and every person needs to answer this question for themselves. Is this a, a fiction or nonfiction? So to wrap it up, there are many compelling parts in this book, as I said. The book is very well written. It's a good read, and I really enjoyed reading it. There were, as I mentioned, few elements in it that didn't resonate with me and still don't. And perhaps, as, as you suggested, maybe I need to read it uh, several times in order to read the messages between the lines. But what I would like to ask you is with so many, let's call them inconsistencies and still question marks that I guess many people have, what, in a nutshell, what makes you believe that this is a true story rather than a dream or writer's imagination? If you read the chapter on who is Christ, that answers all the questions. Because I was uh, a non-believer of anything written in the Bible before. <clears throat> I thought the Bible is just a fiction story. Like People in the church are very uh, hypocritical. They do certain things 
um, they say certain things, but they do other things. And the Catholic priests, they abuse uh, boys. Uh, and also, I believe that the I believe that the church uh, is a organized religion that um, controls people, uh, like mind control people and control people's actions. And people have to donate ten percent of their income to the church and, and to the pastors who abuse boys. I believe none of the nonsense of the of the Christian church. I went to the church only for social reasons, establishing my network, uh, making new friends. But until I, until I read this book, I believed none of the hypocrisy of the Christians uh, that I met. Um, but after reading the book, I believe that uh, some of the things written in the Bible are actually historical events that actually happened. For example, the birth of Jesus from Virgin Mary. Uh, I believe that it wasn't possible, but now I realize that it's actually from the embryo put by the ETs into the uterus of Virgin Mary, so the young Jesus was born. And also it's consistent with a lot of the other spiritual beliefs or Buddhist beliefs of reincarnation because Christ, by having died on, on the cross and resurrected three days after, he was to show people that there's life after death and there is reincarnation. So things uh, can be connected or put together. And this book, I believe, is the missing link uh, among all the different religions, especially the inconsistencies in the Bible. Uh, for some reason, I, I doubted the Bible because Christ called his mother woman. I think that's uh, very upsetting and very uh, disrespect disrespectful. How can you t call your mother woman? She is your own mother. You call her a woman. You are just a, just a, just a, I wouldn't use the word, but it's just a, something that uh, I cannot imagine. But now I understand that Christ is actually a different figure, a different entity that uh, is different from Jesus who died in Japan. Because there's a tomb of Jesus in Shingo village, Japan that there's no way for the author Michael Demarque to know about when he was in Australia writing the book years before the age of internet. And Michael Demarque didn't know how to use a computer, and he never traveled to Japan. How could he have known that there's a tomb of Jesus in Japan? The book has to be a nonfiction, by all means. So that's what I think. <laughs> Thank you. So, is the Aumba prophecy fact or fiction? Perhaps a blend of both. To me, there are still many question marks and several things that simply don't resonate with me. And so I'm still sitting on the fence, but probably more on the side of skepticism. I feel that this is most likely a combination of the actual experience, a dream, and perhaps the writer's embellishment. If you are intrigued by this topic, I encourage you to get the book, read it, perhaps several times, and draw your own conclusion. You will find the links in the show notes on my podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com. Thank you so much, Samuel. It's been such a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.